Hey everyone, so as promised, it's time to start my series on how to fix KH3's story. Starting off on a very different note, when the menu appears, the vibe that we would get would be very different. Instead of seeing Sora on the beach like in the original game, instead of hearing Dearly Beloved once more, we get a downright chilling theme very different from past KH games setting a downright unnerving feeling for the player. Instead of Sora or his friends, we see Master Xehanort having already unlocked Kingdom Hearts and seeing it destroy all of existence, already putting you out of your comfort zone, setting the stage where it to be the darkest, most dire, and most gripping tale out of all the games. No ray of hope, no light. Nothing but a monster seemingly succeeding in bringing the light to its knees. And now, it's up to you to see if this is how the story for your favorite characters ends. As you click New Game, select the difficulty, and start the game as it turns black. Starting up with the story, we see Aqua and Ansem the Wise talking to each other just as they were in the main game, except that Aqua will still have her Keyblade at this point. As they talk to each other, Terranord approaches them and speaks to Ansem about needing his help to assist him in creating vessels so the organization can stay in the present without worry of having to retreat to their time. Aqua prepares to fight him, and you play as her to battle Terranord for the tutorial, and after a short fight, the two seem evenly matched until Terranord reveals that while the other darknesses can only stay in their time for a limited period, he wasn't foolish enough to come alone. Suddenly, Zenless appears and blasts Aqua with his laser attacks until her barrier breaks as Ansem, the Seeker of Darkness, uses his Guardian to grab Aqua and slowly crush her, and then blasts her with a wave of darkness into the dark lake, turning her into anti-aqua, and in the process taking ants and the wise away as they leave the realm of darkness. We then see aqua being possessed by the darkness as the title Cage 3 appears as the screen turns black, setting the tone for the story to come. Suddenly, we see the camera rise from a lake, showing the training world that Kairi and Axel reside in. A lot of their interactions would basically be the same, and it isn't here where you would choose how you want to base your stats in. Since Sora has already been through this dive to the heart thing in the past, Kairi would be the one heading into her own heart to begin her training, with whatever stats you choose to base yourself in would be the one Sora is based in. You would start off by learning magic, flow motion, and melee combat by sparring with Axel. After all, the cutscenes, basically the ones that occur in the main campaign, along with some more in order to develop Kairi and Lee's friendship, things start to go bad. The organization would then make an appearance in the training world, having seemingly defeated Merlin, and the organization members that make an appearance would be Vanitas and Shion attacking the two, and after a short fight, Axel and Kairi would basically have to hightail it out of there, with Axel shedding tears due to feeling Shion's presence without knowing who she is. Master Yen Sid will explain what happened to Kairi and Lee and how they need to change plans since Kairi doesn't have the proper training yet to be a Guardian of Light. At this point, you would finally take control of Sora and start at the Olympus Coliseum, but Maleficent and Pete wouldn't be making appearances at all since they detract from the main focus of the plot. In their place would be Vanitas. Now, Vanitas' role throughout the story would be a skin to a rival character, and since Sora has been sent back to level 1, he, Donald, and Goofy would get their asses swiftly handed to them, but before Vanillas can strike the killing blow, Zigbar would interfere to warn Vanillas about interfering with Sora waking up Ventus, since they would like to use Ventus as a backup plan in case things go very wrong for the Keyblade War. From that part onward, Zigbar would fulfill the role that he plays in the main game, and the story for the Olympus Coliseum would pretty much be the same with Hades actually being a boss fight this time around. Now, disclaimer, Zigbar would not be Lushu in this version. Rather, it would just focus on wrapping up the Xehanort saga first and foremost, leaving Zigbar's character alone and leaving him as the character that he was set up to be in Birth by Sleep. Next, we'd switch to Riku and King Mickey's perspective, 
when they were in the realm of darkness. One thing to keep in mind is that there wouldn't be any pointless retreating and heading back like in the actual game. This section would be a couple of hours where you journey throughout the realm of darkness and fight all kinds of late game heartless to fight with Mickey by your side. You would also have the choice to play as King Mickey instead with Riku as the party member. Think of this as 0.2 but with different places to explore and two different characters to play as. Throughout the segment, Antioquia would stalk the two throughout the worlds that they are trapped in and Mickey and Riku would end up having to contend with some clones of Antioquia along with a few other heartless and at one point would end up getting separated for a bit. Once the two reached the Dark Lake, Antioquia would attack the duo while blaming Mickey for her being trapped for 10 years, and Riku would fight the Demon Tower to free Mickey like in the main game, although instead Riku would actually be successful in doing so. After doing so, Riku would talk Mickey out of blaming himself and to focus on doing what he can to help her now. Mickey would forgive himself for not being able to help Aqua, and then you would find Aqua while playing as Mickey with Riku as your party member. Since Mickey has the most emotional connection to Aqua at this point, and it would give him a chance to save one of his closest friends, and forgive himself for not being able to help her. After doing so, Riku and Mickey would take the unconscious Aqua back to the mysterious tower, where they would also meet Kairi and Lee. Sora, Donald, and Goofy would also show back up at Master Yen Sid's tower, and the latter would explain that Sora needs to recover his lost power and learn the power of waking. The power of waking would be explained as a power used to awaken sleeping hearts similar to Ventus and Sora at one point, and it can also be used to revive hearts that are trapped between the realms of life and death. While Aqua rests, Master Yen Sid would explain what happened to Kairi and Lee, and Yen Sid would assign Lee to join with Riku and Mickey to find Tura and Ventus when Aqua wakes up, and Kairi would be assigned to join with Sora so she can unlock her true power alongside Sora. One reason why I would have this occur is because a lot of the narrative hinges on Sora and Kairi's relationship, so adding her to Sora, Donald, and Goofy's team would give them a chance to play off each other, and we could get a bit more insight into Kairi's character as a whole, and to replace Sora, Donald, and Goofy in a more mentor-like role towards Kairi. The friendship between the SDG trio would be kept just like in the main game, but Kairi would bring a fresh perspective to the adventure, and just like how much Cage 2 was Roxas' story, like Sora's, Cage 3 would be Kairi's story just as much as it is Sora's story. Twilight Town would be kept the same as before, although you would explore a lot more of it, and the Roxas storyline would be shown as before, this line in particular would play a major role later on. Nothing would please us more than Roxas's return, of course. You wish? He'll never answer to you again. Still so blind, a nobody is what's left behind. When one gives his heart to darkness, there is only one way to bring Roxas back which is for you to give your heart up as well. Sora, have you finally decided to call upon the darkness? <gasps> what? Go on then. The shadows are never out of reach. Another thing to keep in mind is that throughout Twilight Town, we also get to see Sora and Kairi exploring the town a lot more, and really get to see how these two interact one on one when they're on their own. Once they head out of Twilight Town, the Toy Box world would stay the same, only this time we get to fight young Xehanort, but he'll simply leave after a short fight where Sora is unable to beat him, and then he forces the team to face a heartless possessed Zerg. Kingdom of Corona would retell the story of the movie, but the parallels that Flynn and Rapunzel share with Sora and Kairi would be much more apparent and Kairi's fears of losing Sora once more would become more noticeable when the two get separated by Marluxia and Larxene near the end of the world. Kairi would be forced to deal with Larxene trying to keep Rapunzel on the tower and manipulating Kairi's desire to find out about her past with Kairi empathizing with Rapunzel's desire to see the outside world. Sora, Don, the Goofy would have to contend with Marluxia as he tries to tempt Flynn into leaving Rapunzel to her fate, since in this version of the story, the organization would also be trying to get their 13th vessel by tempting certain characters to give into their darkness. Sora would quickly realize just how much Flynn's desire to save Rapunzel aligns with himself throughout KH1 and 2, and the three of them would manage to talk Flynn out of leaving Rapunzel by breaking through his darkness. 
Soon, Sora and the team would contend with Gothel, although she would be possessed by a Heartless, but she would still be in her human form. It would basically be a fight, sort of like how Scar was a boss fight in KH2. And so the movie's ending would play out the same, but Kairi's fears about Sora meeting the same fate that Flynn almost met begin to manifest as Sora makes a promise to keep Kairi safe from harm. Coming back to the mysterious tower, Aqua would then wake up and realize what happened to her, and expresses her happiness and mentions what happened to Ants and the Wise, and quickly heads out with Riku, Mickey, and Lee to wake Van up. Once she makes it to Castle Oblivion, you start playing as her with the other Keyblade wielders in your party, and basically go through all the floors to find Ven's resting place. And once you get there, Lee is shocked to see Ven just and mistakes him for Roxas at first. And Riku tries to wake Ven up using the power of waking that he's unlocked, but unlike Sora, Ventus won't wake up since his other half lies in Sora, but of course no one actually knows this yet. Suddenly, Vanitas, along with Marluxia and Larxene, will arrive to take Ven away, and Riku expresses hatred of Marluxia and Larxene for what they did to Sora back in Chain of Memories, and to what ensures is a battle where you fight out the organization's members, and after they retreat, Aqua decides to take Ven away, since it's no longer safe for him in Castle Oblivion, and they all decide to regroup at Radiant Garden. Riku calls Sora and the others over there, and instead of going to the Frozen World, you'd head to Radiant Gardens, and Sora would explain the organization's plan for the princesses of hearts and how the organization is, is trying to tempt other people into giving into the darkness so then that way they can get their 13th vessel. Then you switch to Kyrie and begin exploring the town of Radiant Gardens until you run to Aqua. Aqua realizes who Kyrie is and the former explains what happened to the latter back in Birth by Sleep but after doing so, Kairi would explain how she feels helpless fighting alongside Sora and explains that she wishes to gain more power so she can protect her friends so they won't be put in danger again like their previous adventures. Aqua then begins training with Kairi and using the shot lock command and after a short fight where we get to choose which character we choose to play as, Kairi then learns how to use a shot lock ability and begins to have basic keyblade combos for her to use. The rest of the cast would then show up and the organization would suddenly invade Radiant Gardens with Master Xehanort making his first appearance in the game's story. This is basically where big changes begin to happen throughout the main story. Switching control to Lee, he reunites with Kairi and the two head off to face Syax, and right before doing so, they encounter Demix and Vexen and fight the both of them before Syax intervenes. The duo attempts to fight Syax off, but it ends up in failure with Axel nearly being struck down by Syax and Kairi nearly being killed, but only surviving due to Riku and Mickey arriving to help. Axel then tries to convince Syax to stop, but of course the latter doesn't listen and forces them all back. Kaito, Sora, Donald, and Goofy they journey through the ruins of Radiant Gardens and team up with the former members of the organization to take down some Heartless and soon have a rematch with Vanius, with the battle ending at a tie with no clear winner. Master Xehanort finally appears before the trio and explains his desire to control Kingdom Hearts and then tries to lie to Sora by telling Sora that he wants to control Kingdom Hearts to reset the universe to bring balance in his eyes to the universe. Sora will of course point out for a guy who seeks balance, he uses the darkness to bring misery to others. Xehanort would state, Ah, uh, but darkness is what's needed to prevent the tyranny of light from blinding others. Having my darknesses connect with your seven guardians of light, that is how it would bring forth the key to bringing balance to all world. After all, a boy like you should be well versed in making connections, with all the hearts that lie prisoner within your own. The mastermind would quickly leave and leave Sora to deal with a hooded Shion. After a short fight, Shion's memories begin to resurface which leads to her struggling for a bit until she regains her composure and leaves. Sora begins to shed tears and wonders if the hooded figure is the same girl he saw in the dream world, and then he proceeds to reunite with the other Guardians of Light, and they encounter the entire organization, who explain that their attacks on Radiant Guardians was to ensure that the Guardians of Light were strong enough to fight during the Keyblade Graveyard. The organization soon leaves, with Shion being the last in tow, and at one point, she sees Sora in the form of Roxas and also sees Axel, and slowly begins regaining control, but still leaves. Axel wonders to himself if he knows the hooded girl, and if science is really possible to save without putting him down, while also kicking himself for not being any step closer to bringing back Roxas. The team heads back to the castle, and Zexion explains how he found Roxas, Ventus, and Shion's heart, and in the case of Shion, it would be referred to as an unknown heart, inside Sora, with the latter expressing shock at his relation to Ventus. Yen Sid then heads to Radiant Gardens and explains that Riku, Mickey, Aqua, and Lee 
need to keep watch over Ventus, while Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Kyrie continue training for the upcoming battle and it's making sure that the organization doesn't get their 13th vessel. They journey to the Caribbean, and while they would still go through World's End's plot, the plot of the world itself would be changed so that the organization is looking to use Jack Sparrow as a candidate for one of the 13 darknesses. By exploiting his more selfish character, through his desire to become immortal so he can go throughout the seas forever, but through Sora and his friends, it leads to Jack sacrificing his chance to become immortal, and then he becomes immune to the organization's possession. Will's death would be kept the same, but would also play on Sora and Kairi's fears of never being able to see each other again. Meanwhile, Vex and Endemix's plans stayed the same with the duo portraying the organization and rescuing Anson the Wise, leading to them working with Axel, Riku, and Mickey with trying to bring back Roxas and Namine, but it ends up turning out that since Roxas and Namine can't time travel, they can't be put in replica bodies, and need both Sora and Kairi to lose their hearts in order to do so. This would prevent Roxas and Namine's returns from happening with little to no consequence. The Big Hero 6 world is changed to instead be a retelling of the movie, but with Hero being being influenced by the organization's manipulations of the darkness that lies within his own heart, due to their desire to see if they can use someone's anger to turn them into a heartless, which is meant to hint at how Roxas will come back later on in the story and influence his hero to kill Yokai. But unlike the movie, the organization's influence over Hero corrupts him to the point where vengeance is all he wants at this point. To the point where he ends up being more antagonistic towards his friends than he was in the actual movie, which also ends up putting him in conflict with Sora, the gang, and the rest of Big Hero 6, to the point where they had to fight Baymax with Hero controlling him, but Sora and the gang managed to push Hero away from his desires for vengeance, but not before a darkness-influenced Hero asks if Sora would be acting the same way if his own brother was murdered, which would play a major role in his attitude later down the line. Kairi also expresses her desires to bring Namine back to life, and she also encounters Shion, and at one point, she sees her face shocking her to the core for their similar appearances. Sora also keeps the same mentor-esque role in the Big Hero 6 world, and after fighting Yokai, you would also fight the Riku replica fighting alongside Dark Baymax, after Baymax sacrifices himself, where you have to bring Baymax back to his senses, which allows the original Baymax to survive the events of the film where he sacrifices himself. Monstropolis is the final world you explore before the final segments of the game happen, and the plot of the world changes a fair bit, with Phineas already being returned, duh, and choosing to manipulate Randall and use his knowledge of scare technology to cause trouble against Sora and Kairi, particularly against the former. With Phineas' darkness infused into it, Randall modifies the scare extractor from the film into a blaster that can end up causing someone to fall unconscious and go through their worst fears. Half of the world's plot would be kept like the original game with Randall wanting revenge on Mike and Sully for the events of the original film, but Randall would be fought at the halfway point and after being defeated, Vanillas backstabs him and leaves him for dead, leading to Randall for a short time being a guest party member just to get even with Vanillas. Sora and Kairi end up getting separated from the group at one point and end up meeting Vanillas once more. After a fight, Vanillas would blind the duo and use a blaster to knock Sora out, and from that point on, you would play as Sora in an almost Scarecrow Arkham-like nightmare segment, exploring Sora's worst fears. The first one would involve him reliving the events of the Destiny Island's destruction, with an illusion of Riku being possessed by Ansem happening in the dream sequence, and in a repeat of KH1, ends up destroying the island that Sora is on. This would exploit Sora's fears of reliving the events of the Destiny Island's destructions, and losing Riku to darkness. The next illusion happens when Sora falls into the dive to the heart arena. A hooded Vanius appears and recites the idea that Sora's heart is a prison, and right when Sora clashes with Vanius, the hood falls down to reveal an illusion of Roxas who blames Sora for having his existence taken away from him, with an illusion of Shion also appearing and blaming Sora for her not being remembered by anyone and leading to her death, leading to Sora having to fight both illusions at once and after defeating them, the floor breaks and has Sora fall into another floor and he suddenly hears Kairi calling for help. When he finds her, he sees her being struck down by a mysterious hooded figure, enraging Sora and leading to a fight. The figure uses whatever keyblade Sora has equipped and would also use all of his drive forms and magical attacks. After a fight, Sora takes off the figure's hood, instead revealing it to be a version of Sora possessed by Xehanort with white hair and yellow eyes, shocking Sora until he looks at his own hands and realizes He's wearing an organization cloak, and then he looks at his reflection and sees himself as the possessed Sora. And in the illusion, he sees Kairi once more and in a nightmare prepares to kill her, 
thus exploring Sora's fears of being possessed by Xehanort and killing Kairi. Before Donald, Goofy, Mike, and Sully manage to wake him up, explaining that Kairi got separated from Sora at one point, Sora then proceeds to chase down Vanius and they fight each other once more, with Vanius trying to kill Kairi so then that way he can tempt Sora into giving in to his own anger, and while Sora seemingly triumphs over Vanius with the help of Donald, Goofy, Kairi, Mike, and Sully, Vanius gets up none the worse for the wear, and says that he seems to be ready to wake up Sleepyhead. Right before the team leaves, Sora looks at his hand as it shifts to his possessed self's hand, with his own voice going off saying, No matter how much you try to run, you have already bathed in the darkness of sleep, and as long as she's with you, the shadows will always consume you. You will never escape your destiny. Kairi then asks if Sora is okay, but Sora, in a rare moment where he actually begins to show fear, he says no, he really isn't, and they proceed to leave the world. The team heads back to Radiant Gardens, meeting the others with Aqua despairing over being unable to wake Ventus up. Sora, due to his close proximity towards Ven, begins to be stuck in an almost trance-like state, where then he decides to meet Ven face to face for the first time ever, and suddenly, Ven unconsciously summons his Keyblade back, and takes back the part of his heart that lies within Sora, finally awakening himself. Everyone seems to be excited over Ventus's return, and Sora and Ventus do get to interact with each other for a bit, talking to each other for the first time, until Vanius appears before them, mockingly congratulating them for doing so. Sora prepares to fight Vanius on his own, but suddenly realizes that his Keyblade won't materialize. Since Ventus was the part of his heart that allows him to wield the Keyblade, without that part, Sora can't use his Keyblade. Switching to Ventus, he and Aqua prepare to fight side by side to fend off Vanius, and after doing so, Terranort makes his first appearance, horrifying Ventus over Terra's fate, and nearly destroys the castle, forcing the Guardians of Light to retreat back to the mysterious tower. The cutscenes that take place before the Keyblade Graveyard fight are kept the same with Axel and Syax. Always told you they'd stop you from crying, the upside down tears. Would you get lost? I'll clobber you tomorrow! I expect no less. Ventus and Aqua do interact with each other like the main game, but Sora would show up and talk to Ventus one on one, as Sora realizes it's Ven's heart that gave him the power in the previous games, with Ven telling Sora that as far as he's concerned, he should have one and thanks him for bringing him back, while offering to let Sora borrow his own Keyblade, with Sora refusing to do so since he is not willing to put others at risk. They then discuss their respective journeys with each other, and we get to see how the two play off each other for an extended period. We then see Mickey, Donald, and Goofy at Disney Castle, with Mickey being ready to give his final goodbyes to Minnie and Pluto, knowing that this might be the last time he sees them, and we get to see Mickey and Minnie talking to each other about the upcoming battle, and how it might be the last time Mickey comes back, with Donald and Daisy having the same scene together. And after that, Mickey then proceeds to thank Donald and Goofy for all their help, as the latter two tell him before they leave that it's been honor serving him. And after that, we cut to the Destiny Islands where Sora and Riku sit where they were in the first game, with Sora mentioning his encounters with Vanius and the darkness, and his worries that he will end up killing both Riku and his Kairi. Riku tells Sora that if the former could overcome his own darkness, then he trusts Sora to overcome it himself, but which also leads to Sora being upset about needing to give into darkness to bring Roxas back, with Riku admittingly not being able to get through to Sora on that point, and only being able to tell Sora that they'll find a way, and then jokingly says that he'll bring him back to the light if something happens, by saying that Kairi would probably kill him if he didn't do so which ends up to the two having a good laugh over that. Kairi then walks up to the two and they have a discussion about how far they've come and how it feels just like yesterday that they first left the island. They wonder about what they'll do if they win the final fight, with none of them being able to come up with a good answer. Riku soon leaves and makes peace with the Riku replica like in the original game, and Sora and Kairi would have their scene like in the original game. What? Huh? <laughs> Tomorrow's fight will be our toughest yet. Kyrie, I'll keep you safe. Mm -mm. Let me keep you safe. The Guardians then proceed to reunite in Yen Sid's tower, where the scene is being kept the same, and Yen Sid would instead be conflicted over Sora staying with the other heroes, since he has no Keyblade at this point. Suddenly, 
The organization would instigate a full-on assault on the tower, with young Xenarch leading the nobodies to perform the assault. With Yen Sid teleporting most of the Guardians away to Twilight Town, while Mickey stays behind, and we get to have Mickey and Yen Sid take on the nobodies, and at one point, young Xehanort. And after depleting his health bar, young Xehanort heavily wounds Yen Sid, and young Xehanort begins to leave, warning Mickey that if they try to avoid the Keyblade Graveyard, they'll come back to finish off Yen Sid, leading to the point where the Guardians make the decision to head over to the Graveyard. Right before leaving, Sora, Don, and Gooby have one more scene where the latter two promise to make sure they stick with Sora to the end, thus leading into the Keyblade Graveyard. When the team heads to the Keyblade Graveyard, the 10,000 Heartless battle begins. Since Sora has no Keyblade at this point, he isn't able to participate in the fight, and Mickey sends the other Guardians of Light to go on ahead. At this point, for the first time in the series, you play as Mickey, but with Donald and Goofy by his side essentially having the Disney trio fight alongside each other for the first time. After the trio reunites with the other Guardians of Light, Luxor appears and traps the other Guardians of Light in cards for a few minutes, and then Kairi and Sora are forced to deal with him. Although this time you play as Kairi, but Sora is only able to attack by using magic. After a fight, he gives Sora the trump card like he does in the original game, but this time it's used for something very differently, but you'll see later on in the story. After the other Guardians of Light are free, Ventus and Aqua encounter Turinort once more. This time, a fight doesn't ensure with Turinort. He just taunts the other Guardians of Light and basically leaves. And then, the Heartless Tornado is just immediately summoned. Control switches to Sora, who is only able to wield magic in a battle with the other Guardians of Light against the Heartless Tornado that you ultimately lose against. After that, Donald uses Zeta Flare against it, killing a chunk of the Heartless with it, but it ultimately isn't enough as the Guardians of Light are quickly overwhelmed, but they still go down with a fight. Where they are not killed, they are simply incapacitated at the moment, with the only Guardians of Light still around to fight being Riku, Kairi, and Sora. Sora ends up breaking down at this moment, upset about how he couldn't protect his friends, and gets upset at himself believing that since he has no Keyblade and no friends left to back him up, he's worthless. Riku, like in the trailer, tells Sora that he doesn't believe that, and tries to fight out the Heartless, but seemingly gets killed. At that moment, Master Xehanort and Phineas appear to mock Sora as a dull, ordinary boy, and then they send Marluxia and Larxene out to fight Kairi, and Kairi ultimately isn't able to fight them off, and is tortured by the two, leading to Sora losing himself to his anger, and tapping into his rage form to defeat them. He manages to kill both Marluxia and Larxene, and Marluxia does end up regaining his memories, and ends up apologizing to Sora about what he did to him back in Chain of Memories and now. And thus, Sora finally loses his heart to darkness, and seemingly fades away into the depths of darkness, and it seems that all hope is lost, until a bright light shines down from above and crashes down onto the floor. And then suddenly, after 11 years, Roxas finally returns.